Three days before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I was moderating a lunch in Munich of YES, and General Petraeus, who is on the panel here with me today, was on the panel at this lunch. And I said to him, what is the most important thing for you right now? This was before the terrible invasion had happened. And he said to me, the big question is, if there is a Russian attack, the main question is, will Ukrainians fight? Well, we now know the answer to that question. The heroism, the determination, the effectiveness, the bravery with which the men and women on this stage and so very many others have defended their country is something that I think all of us, all of us around the world, are standing in awe and admiration of. It's been extraordinary. But it is still ongoing. It is still a long way from the end. It is ongoing. And so now, 18 months on, I'm going to have a conversation with these remarkable men and women about why they fight, what are they fighting for. I think it is important that we hear directly from them, not from our leaders in the West, not from our people, but from the people of Ukraine, and particularly the heroes of Ukraine. And I'm going to briefly introduce them. First, immediately to my left, to your right, is Denis Zaikov. He is currently fighting. Yesterday, he was at the front. Next to him, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Next to him is Dmitry Finashin, an intelligence officer of the National Guard of Ukraine and a hero of Ukraine too. Welcome. Next to him is Yegor Filsov, also a, a, a soldier in the armed forces of Ukraine. Thank you for being here. Next to him is Masi Nayem. He's the founder of the Miller Law Firm, but also a military officer. He was at the front of the armed forces of Ukraine. Thank you for being here. And next to him is Alina Mikhailova. She is a military paramedic and a volunteer of the armed forces of Ukraine. Thank you for being here. And last but not least is the man who posed that question to me, General Petraeus. But before, before we have that conversation, I'm delighted to say that we are going to hear from Rustem Umerov, the new Minister of Defense, who is coming here in his first public appearance, his second day, third day of being minister. And thank you for making the time. And, and I would like to say that the minister is going straight from here to the front line. So thank you for being here. And minister, may I invite you to make some remarks first? Dear colleagues, dear heroes, dear distinguished guests, it's an honor for me to be present here. Uh, one million Ukrainians today are in the Ukrainian Defense Forces. Among them, more than 800,000 are Ukrainian Armed Forces. Our army today is one of the biggest, strongest, and most motivated in the world because we know what we fight for, for our people, for our homes, for our freedom. Two days ago, I was entrusted by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to become Ukraine's defense minister. I'm grateful to Mr. President for the trust. This is a huge honor and huge responsibility for me to hold this position in this historical and crucial times for Ukraine. 
Mr. President said yesterday, and I share the same values, the highest priority for us today is our warriors, their lives, safety, dignity. We have to introduce a new philosophy of attitude to warriors. My responsibility as a Minister of Defense is to make everything possible and impossible to ensure that our warriors are provided and equipped with everything necessary. Weapons, military equipment, uniforms, means of personal protection, food, medicines, healthcare, education, human resources and recruiting, even burial ceremonies. We'll release all our children, all our prisoners of war, political prisoners, civilians. We will bring everyone back home. We have to ensure respect for soldiers' dignity in all interactions with the state. This also includes digitalization. There is no place for bureaucracy and paperwork for the army in the war. Everything has to be digitized, and we will take care of cybersecurity. Next point is weaponry. We need it today, we need it now, we need it more. I take this opportunity to address our international partners. We are stronger together. We're grateful for all the support provided, but we need to continue our war coalition efforts to win this war. We need more heavy weaponry, heavy weaponry, and again, heavy weaponry. Ukrainian warriors today are sacrificing their lives for the core values of democracy and freedom. They need backup from your side, dear partners, and this backup is weapons. Our focus is to strengthen existing cooperation and expand geography to establish new partnerships and coalitions. Because our aim is a victory strategy. Our ministry is a key institution responsible for forming the strategies and policies in defense. Our new national security and defense strategy of Ukraine is based on the victory doctrine of the president of Ukraine and new challenges and realities. Our goal is to become a NATO member. No doubt that this day will soon come, hopefully. And dear colleagues, we have big challenges ahead and big opportunities ahead. Every day we advance and every day we make our victory closer. Ukraine will win. Glory to Ukraine. Slava Ukraini. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Thank you for those remarks. You were kind enough to say that I could ask you a couple of questions, sure. so I'm going to. The, you said in your remarks just now that we need a new philosophy of attitude to warriors. What do you mean by that? Everything comes from human rights, and it's a right of a warrior to be equipped, to be having everything uh, for the war and to win the war. So, which means that what I've addressed in our speech and philosophy that life is important, a person is important. We will uh, win in this war. We will buy everything necessary with equipment. We don't care about it. We, we focus on uh, human lives. We focus on our people. So those are the things that uh, we would have to focus on. And that's why, as a Minister of uh, Defense, uh, we will be probably introducing a new uh, position called uh, Military Ombudsman that will be focusing to the military needs of the people and our warriors. Thank you. And you were very clear, you addressed your foreign partners, you said you need more heavy weaponry, heavy weaponry, heavy weaponry, and then you said you are seeking to strengthen existing cooperation, expand geography, new partnerships and coalitions. Can you elaborate on that? Sure, our main goal is NATO membership, and uh, we are in a very tough neighborhood. We see that the Black Sea is also encircling uh, by the uh, enemy, so we think that Baltic Sea, uh, Black Sea, Caspian Sea, Adriatic Sea is our uh, 
priorities in this region, and we would be looking not only to the regional expansion, but also to the thematic expansion, which means that we have, we need a support in Navy, we need a air defense, uh, uh, we need artillery, so we need to uh, make additional coalitions, IT coalition, uh, as I said, air defense coalition, so that's our expansion dimension. Thank you very much. I would love to ask you more questions, but you must get to the front line. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we turn to those of you who are serving, to the heroes of Ukraine. And I want to ask each of you what you are fighting for. And Masi, I'd like to start with you, because you have the misfortune of having met me before. And so if you've met me before, then you know that I can ask you the first question. So could you tell us, because you've told me before very eloquently, what it is that you are fighting for? I will speak Ukrainian, regrettably, but for me, this is a very fortunate thing. You are right that those who are talking about war, there's a lot of high falutin in the, of this. Luckily, I don't have such words. I cannot say that I'm war waging the war for the sake of new values. I want revenge. I want revenge in the most horrific way that the international conventions would allow. The more Russians die, the better it is as a combatant. And, you know, I still have the right to kill Russians. And this is what I want most of all. Why? This is my next message. I want to do this because Russia has taken away many people from us. I want not, not to be ashamed before them. I want my friends who have not been mobilized not to be mobilized. I'm not among those who would say you all have to go to war. I want to do all I can so that you don't go to war. I want most of the people on this planet to survive. And I also wage a war for, you know, my, my father was the doctor of philosophy. When I asked him about what freedom is, he said, this is when you have the right to choose. When we talk about independent Ukraine, I do not say that we are totally independent. We depend on our friends. We depend on our, their help. But this was our choice, whether we depend on Russia and share their system of coordinates, or whether we depend on our international partners. And I want to retain this choice to have the opportunity to choose the way of life that I want to lead. And I want the rules of uh, the game be here, and that this is determined by the force of law, not by the law of force, as they do this in Russia. And this is everything that I wage the war for. And I'm very sorry for not having said something that would provoke you to say, yes, you are a hero, but you know, there's a lot of bad things happening in the war. Usual people, average people die there, and every wounded person is wounded until the end of their lives, and everyone who has died won't say anything. And unfortunately, there's a lot of high highfalutin sayings about war, but this is kind of a swing which swings from bad to worse. And from if we say that we all are heroes, this won't bring back to life some of us. That is a, it's, a, it's a powerful and an important point to make. Um, 
Dimitro, can I turn to you next? And I'm going to ask you the same question. What, it is, what is it that you have made such a clear sacrifice for? For me, this war has been broken into four stages that I was not thinking about before. This was an axiom for me, something like the fight for my family, for my home. But then I understood, realized that there are four steps. One, the first was the territorial integrity of our country during the anti-terrorist operation in 2014. I went to join the troops, but I was not able to join the fighting because not everything depends on the will of a soldier. Then I went to the front and by that time the major aim for me was justice because by that time too many people have died in the war and the goal was to bring Russia to responsibility. You know, you want some justice, but if you cannot bring the culprits to the dock, then the only way is to wash this with blood on the battlefield. That's what we are doing now. The third stage was the full-scale war launched on the 24th of February when the price became the existence of the Ukrainian nation and the Ukrainian state. Something extraordinary happened then as far as the unification and joining forces of the people is concerned. We saw how the nation becomes awake and how people gather to defend their country. And for me now, this is probably more the war for democracy and uh, freedom. But yes, it does remain to some extent revenge and uh, bring into responsibility. Because yes, Russia is violating international law. And yes, we have to win our victory and gain justice because people who are dying now are the most passionate people they are the flower of our nation, our sons and daughters who would be forming the face of our country, but they are not with us anymore. And you know, because they die, the people who remain are, there's more among them of, of those who are not as passionate about Ukraine. We are at the moment fighting for the democracy all over the world and we are working uh, fighting against the global terrorist who tries to put their claws into everything so please help us help us thank you Igor, can i turn to you next you were an mp uh, you then became a soldier you've been fighting what is it that you are fighting for Good health to everyone. You know the question what I'm fighting for, I was asking myself. After several months of the war, despite the fact that I was in the armed forces from the very first day, but you know when the armed forces are on the offensive, you don't ask yourself such things. You're just doing your business, your military business. My mom is now in Italy and she called me and she complained that Italians are asking them, uh, her, why does your uh, son, uh, why he's at war and what he's fighting for? And mom called me and tried to ask me what she should answer. And I told her, don't tell them how would Italians behave if they were attacked. You should more talk more about the specific concrete situation that we are in and how you would behave if your towns and your schools in my native town of Divka, your parks, your kindergartens were destroyed, your neighbors were wounded, your 
women would be raped, how would you behave? Do you have something that you would fight for? And of course there is there is something, because you see with your own eyes how your city is being destroyed and raised to the ground. I remember very, very clearly how when the Russians have withdrawn from the surroundings of Kiev, I went to Avdiivka. I was going there, traveling there, and I remember very clearly that I was asking myself, why am I going there? I was not summoned there, but then I understood that I had to be in Avdiivka, and Avdiivka was my native town. I had what to defend there, but within the 18 months of the war, I did start to feel deeper senses. Yes, we are fighting for our people, we are fighting for our near and dear, but recently I have become aware that Ukrainians are fighting for their right to be happy. We have been unhappy for so long that now, when they are destroying our values and our cities, we understood that if we do not defend our freedom, then without freedom we would be unhappy. And if I'm not mistaken, in 2020, 2019, at the Yalta European strategy, we were talking about happiness. I do not remember the details, but I remember one important thing, that Ukrainians uniquely were different from other nations, that in that for that moment they were feeling unhappy, but they believed that they will be happy in the future. And this is our chemistry. This uniqueness is our chemistry. We understand this is the situation is very bad now, but we have to withstand and to sustain it in order to be happy or make or may at least make happy our children and our grandchildren and our families. And the last thing is and by the way, people on the front line are thinking about this. Maybe we are not defending just our rights and our happiness, but we are defending also the happiness of other nations. Dennis, let me now turn to you. And I think you have been most recently of everyone, even here, you have come from the front line. Tell us first where you have come from. Hello, everybody. I am Captain Zaikov. I represent the 25th Detached uh, Air, uh, Airborne Division. Yesterday, I was on a combat mission uh, on Svatove direction. As I am here, I cannot but use this moment to thank our foreign colleagues on behalf of the command of my brigade and everyone there. Please accept my words of gratitude for your help and the support that we get from you. Thank you. But let's go back to the question. What we are fighting for? For me personally, the war started back in 2014. I have been serving in the armed forces for 10 years almost. Six years I've been fighting on the front line. This is rather difficult and many, I have lost many friends. However, I think that the goal, the aim of this war which we have to attain is our free Ukraine, our state, our land, our values. And of course we have to remember 
and mention our relatives, our families, and first of all, our children. I do not want my children or children of anyone who's here see what the eyes of these heroic people who are sitting bes be beside me have seen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alina, could I now turn to you and ask you the same question? Because these are all incredibly powerful answers from all of you. Uh, what is it that you are fighting for? Slava Ukraini. Glory to Ukraine, glory to the heroes. Uh, I will be speaking I, on the spot of the moment. I did not prepare any speeches, and I would not be using um, high-flown uh, vocabulary to discuss what we are fighting for. It is quite natural. We are there because we, un and even uh, when we understand that we can be killed at any moment, we are still there. On the 18th of February 2022, uh, uh, I spoke in Munich saying that we are about to be in a war. We need uh, armament, we need equipment, we need to uh, put up resistance to Ukraine. And in a couple of days, the all-out war started. And I joined my unit. Uh, and even though I had served as a volunteer for three years before, it was the 24th of February 2023 that um, made it for real. And so I joined my unit in Abdivka, and the, later on we were called up to the armed forces of Ukraine, and I joined the regular army. Uh, I've been there for... Uh, 18 months now, of which I visited home, say, for 20 days, not longer. Why uh, have I opted for this way? Why am I still there? Over the year and a half of this war, a lot has changed. A lot has changed in my life, particularly things that I mentioned on the 18th of February 2022, because we could never imagine what the scale of this war could be, that uh, aircraft would be dropping bombs on civilians. Nobody could have ever fathomed that. Russia has started that war, uh, and it uh, continues to uh, commit such atrocities. And I now have a whole body of evidence that today Russia is not punished for what it's doing, for the atrocities that they've committed so far, as I warned back in early February 2022. When asked what I am um, fighting for, I can tell you that I really, uh, sorry, I can start crying now. I really, really realized that. Sorry. Yeah, that's why I didn't uh, want to speak from this stage. When I lost a very dear person, I'm sorry. Quite recently, um, Alina's uh, beloved Da Vinci was killed at the front line. That's why uh, she's speaking over this uh, uh, knot in her in her neck, my uh, throat, my uh, uh, be beloved Da Vinci was also our commander, and he had been fighting uh, till he was killed since 2014. And I always ask him, how come that you persevere? Where do you get all this strength uh, and uh, stamina? But he said, uh, if I stop fighting, Russia will be here, no matter what it is in ivano Frankivsk, where he was from, Kiev or Avdivka, where we were fighting together. Only upon losing uh, this uh, man, who I loved immensely, who I shared a lot with, did I understand 
that we people in the battalion were all orphaned. I was there just for the sake of one man, this man. I wanted to be by him. I wanted to be his left, uh, left right hand. I wanted to uh, be with him all the time. I uh, knew that uh, we uh, would be supporting one another. And now every man Men and women at the front line need someone to fight for. It could be their family members. It could be somebody who would not drop their eyes when they see a person in the uniform. They would not um, evade uh, hard discussions with uh, soldiers, veterans with disabilities, with amputated limbs. It is essential for all of us to understand why uh, Men and women are there, are fighting every minute, uh, attacking uh, small woodlands in Kharkiv Oblast or, say, a ravine in um, Kherson uh, Oblast. So I want all of you to be fair and to be frank with your own uh, heart and conscience. You should understand why they are there. We can be discussing values, democracy, things like this, but there are very basic things. They have been articulated uh, very clearly, and that would be either a person you hold uh, dear, a person who's waiting for the soldiers at the front line, or a stranger in the street who would come up to you and say thank you. That's uh, very important. These are very salient things. This is what people are laying their lives for. We are suffering huge casualties. There is no uh, romanticizing uh, battle, war. It is dirty, it is nasty and bad. I've been um, fighting for almost five years now, and during the rotation uh, at the Kupiansk access, it was for the first time that I was prepared to give I, uh, everything out. Uh, in order for my battalion to survive. Because what we are witnessing on the front line today is what, unfortunately, you would not learn from the newsreels, uh, from the news feeds, from newspapers or TV reports. And um, uh, some of the recent uh, pieces of legislation uh, feel like slap uh, on on the face uh, to the military uh, men and uh, women uh, there at the front line. We should all contribute as uh, members of the armed forces, as volunteers, as uh, uh, those who work in the rear, those who um, understand that our veter veterans with disabilities are our people. We have to be supportive. Uh, some think that victory would come very soon. No, it won't. Uh, not today not the day after, not in a year even. For us to achieve victory, we all have to unite, to be as one very strong fist. And uh, we should work together in the armed forces, uh, in relations between the armed people and civilians, in overcoming political bickering and things like this. We have to survive. We have to go through these hardships. But for that, we need all to realize why our armed forces are there, why we should persevere against all odds, because that's exactly what we are doing. Our people are fighting there heroically. I mean it. They understand that, but for them, there, Russians would be in Kiev in no time. And every time you go to bed, every night, you should remind yourself um, how hard it is uh, to them there. Yesterday, I uh, slept in my bed for the first time in a long time, and I said, I'm not at the front line. I can keep calm. Russians are not here. They won't be here either tomorrow or in a month. But if those who are at the front line now retrieve, 
then perhaps we would have to face Russians at our doorstep here in Kiev. I will repeat myself yet again. Uh, this question is asked uh, of us. We all know why we are there, but I would appreciate if all of you here in this room and beyond could ask this question of yourselves and answer it honestly. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Thank you to all of you. Uh, listening to all of you, but listening to you particularly, I, I found myself asking the question you were asked, where do you get your strength from? But in hearing all of what you said, you have all given different reasons. Different reasons from the sake of one man, the sake of your families, the right to be happy, the right to defend freedom, the right to choose the rule of law and not the law of force. There have been highfalutin answers, as you put it, Masi. There have been honest answers. They are all extraordinarily powerful. I want to come back to ask all of you some more questions. But first, David Petraeus, you've, you've led many people into, into battles. I suspect you are moved perhaps not quite as much as I am, because you're more experienced at this, but quite considerably when you hear all of this. When you hear these extraordinary testaments and explanations and heartfelt assessments of why Ukraine is fighting, what does it make you feel? Well, first of all, I think I'm actually moved even more. Um, if Commanders never get hardened to casualties. In fact, it gets tougher and tougher and tougher. Um, yes, you can learn how to control that, but um, what you've seen is so inspirational, and it's why it is such a privilege to wear the uniform of one's nation. Um, I was privileged to do that for over 37 years. Um, I was privileged to serve with innumerable heroes during that time, including those that I was privileged to command in five combat commands and two different wars. Um, and I just want to tell each of you here what a tremendous honor it is to be on stage with each of you, with these heroes, and above all, to be able to express to you how much admiration all those around the world have for you and for those that you represent, um, and frankly, for your family members uh, and for the citizenry of this uh, country, which has truly mobilized the entire country uh, for its war of independence. All of Ukraine, especially though clearly those in uniform, um, have demonstrated incredible courage, extraordinary service, uh, and tremendous sacrifice. Uh, and I want you to, to know, Alina, I didn't realize we were going to be on stage together today, but the group that I'm um, here with in Ukraine, uh, each of us laid a rose at the grave of da Vinci uh, yesterday afternoon, and it was a very moving experience. Um, I should note, by the way, you know, you threw out the question that I asked at Munich at that wonderful event that Victor uh, always hosts, but it was particularly meaningful uh, two years ago and then last year. And thank you for hosting this as well. Uh, we all applaud you uh, for what you have done uh, in so many different ways, Victor. But I believed I knew the answer to the question, will they fight? But I still needed to ask it because that was going to be the biggest uh, uh, question that would be answered. I'd been to the front, I'd been to, the, to Donbass uh, previously. I had seen how far Ukrainian forces had come since 2014, all of the additional professional expertise uh, weaponry and so forth, and I was very confident that Ukrainians would fight. In fact, I was one of the very rare people who said prior to the invasion that if Russia does invade, I don't believe they'll take Kyiv, much less topple the government and do what everybody else was saying all the way up to the Dnipro or something like that, and it would be a guerrilla war. Um, again, that was based on my assessment, 
But the truth is that what Ukrainians have done has been vastly greater than that, obviously. You've fought brilliantly, uh, tenaciously, uh, incredible determination, uh, impressive adaptation, um, inspiring the entire world, tremendous expertise, uh, and also, again, with extraordinary uh, courage. And you've heard some of that here. I do want to talk a tiny bit about the question that you have posed, though, because I think there actually are two questions. And I pondered this an awful lot over the years, including one time when I was privileged to lead what we believe was the largest re-enlistment ceremony in US military history, 1,215 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines in Baghdad at the end of the surge. Re-enlisting, hand in the air, I was the re-enlistment officer, and I'm is asking myself, why are they doing this? They've been in combat this time 15 months straight, had done it again and again, and they're volunteering to serve again. And I think there are two questions here. One is, why does someone volunteer to serve? And then actually, why do you fight when you're in tough combat? And I think there's a little bit of a distinction, and we've heard the answers really to both of these, but I want to make that distinction a little bit. You serve because it is a mission greater than self, an extraordinary privilege to help preserve your country's very independence, its survival, its way of life, and all of that. But you fight in tough combat, I think, and we might go back and ask this question, when it really is tough on the front lines, in the brotherhood of the close fight, as it's called, which includes women as well as men, of course, you fight for those who are on your right and left because you have fierce determination not to let them down. Uh, and that, I think, is another element of this that is hugely important. You heard that where Alina is describing not wanting to let her commander down, wanting to serve him, wanting to be his left and right hand, wanting to, that element of this that small unit where the fighting is really done is something that is truly extraordinary. And again, that's why we describe this as the brotherhood of the close fight, which I believe is the most elite fraternity uh, in the entire world. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, I think that's a very important distinction, General, um, that the why you serve and, and what, what you are fighting for when you are in, as I, as I can only imagine, in, in close combat. I wanted to ask the heroes here on this panel, though, a different question, and I'm sorry that it's a slightly more difficult subject, but you have all given incredibly powerful reasons for why you are fighting. But not everyone in your country is at the front. Many people are not at the front. I'm here back in Kiev for the first time since late March, last year when it was a city under siege and the Russians were just still in Bucha and other places. And now it feels like a vibrant city with cafes, with normal life. And I wanted to ask you how you feel about that and whether you feel that you have the full support of your country. In, in one sense, it is incredibly united. But how do you feel, people who are at the front, about whether the effort of the whole of your society is with you. And Diego, I might start with you because you were an MP. You understand the importance of, of popular support, which is clearly there. Don't get me wrong. It is clearly there, the popular support. But how do you feel when you come to Kiev now and you see the city as it is? You know, when I lost my second eye, I thought that I would never be confused or taken for my brother, but they still confused me. I was never in a parliament. You said that I was in a parliament. I wasn't. I don't think I was addressing, Matthew, the question to you, but maybe my... my I, I was addressing it to Ego, yeah. But that's okay. We can hear from you, too. We can take it in turns to answer this exactly. we'll question. We'll hear it from both of you. So, Matthew, why don't you start? I do know exactly who you are. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, first place, in the first place, for me, 
This is a constant. The Russians wants, want us to continue suffering. If someone isn't suffering in Ukraine, despite the war and the losses and bereavements that they are causing, then you are doing what the Russians don't want from you. So you are um, carousing, you are drinking. This is wonderful. This is the best efficiency that the Ukrainian armed forces are demonstrating. But you know, your first question and this question, they echo. I keep asking myself a question. Why do you keep asking us this? It seems to me that you, during this panel discussion, ask us about the sense of why we are fighting in this war. You know why? I think that you are lost yourselves. This is to mean that this is a question has become a really acute question. It's so nonsensical. You're not asking me here what kind of a day it is, whether it's a day or a night. You know that this is definitely a day, but I understand that you're confused and baffled, and I know why you're asking us for sure. You know, if you get go to ask me right now what I am experiencing, I could tell you so many more in different insights, but you're not asking me that. You're you are lost, you are confused, and you want to get some support from us. You want us to support you and say to you, you will handle it, because you are the civilian society, come on, you can handle it. But the question that you are asking us, whether this support is sufficient for us, you are asking because perhaps you are feeling guilty in a way, feeling at fault. Maybe the majority of you, are you feeling that uh, this guilt just because you are not fighting on the front line? Let's be frank, perhaps the majority of you are feeling at fault for that, feeling guilty for not fighting. But I can tell you honestly that for me this support is not enough, the support of the government, because my guys are dying. I'm looking for money for my unit. I'm fundraising. I keep calling different clients of my law firm to make sure that they can help us. One uh, UAV that we require right now costs 670,000 produced by EOS made in Estonia. Recently it was damaged and the repair work cost $17,000. And I'm looking to fundraise for it. Is this okay? This is definitely not okay. But you are helping anyway. So what is my point? Having parties and relaxing, this is very good, but this is a long pathway and this will not result in winning this war in a year or two years time. I will probably surprise you. No victories will come in five years for us. It's impossible claiming um, uh, nuclear weapons from Russians in five years. This is definitely not impossible. This is a, a war for much longer, much longer than I would have probably thought to myself. Recently I fell in love and I caught myself thinking, I like the country of Turkey. Perhaps one day I will go to her with her to Turkey, but I will never go to Turkey with her, not in a year or in two years' time. I won't be able to, simply. So my point is, we need to learn to be happy during the war. Definitely, it's a must. And if we are happy during the war, helping the military, not just because of feeling guilty, but just to make sure that your nearest and dearest, your children, don't get to go to this war. This is what matters, because right now you're doing it as if I, you owe it to me, or you owe it to Alina or Igor. Yeah, let's just face it. You're looking at us, the military, and you're fearful that one day we'll throw it in your face and say, what are you up to? What are you busy doing? I won't do it, because I love Ukrainians. I love people. I will never begin to repute the society saying, what are you busy dealing with and doing? Of course, inwardly, I'm so wrenched that my friends are dying or have died, but I'm not going to rebuke my society just because I want you to help out of the feeling of guilt. I know you, I know, and you say a lot of very powerful things, but there are many other heroes I would like to hear from too. Diego. What's this question? Well, the question actually uh, was, uh, do you feel, when you are here in Kiev, do you feel that you are having enough support in the, that was my, the question I asked to Masi. Do you, but I'm actually going to rephrase it for you slightly, which is, what is the kind of society you would like your country to be that you are fighting for now? What are the changes you would like to see? What is the new kind of Ukraine that you are fighting for? You know, it seems to me these are two pretty different questions, and of course the answers will definitely vary. So let me be brief. The first point. Honestly, when I come to Kiev, I feel so happy. 
unecstatic to see peace over our heads. And it would be probably surprising to come to Kiev and to see that there are lots of holes in the ground and there are uh, different counts of missiles shelling above us, etc. This is the first point. The second point, this is the sense for the sake of which we are fighting on the front line. We are so aware, acutely aware, that if we are fighting there on the front line here, we are ensuring peace. So this is not in vain. This is already gaining, getting some extra weight to our mission. And in answer to your question, what kind of society we are lacking, the society that we have is quite enough for me, because I'm getting support from the society but generally. And Masi has just raised a very important point, because I'm a commander of assault uh, UAVs unit. All of the UAVs that we have been using, they have been our U uh, drones. I mean, your drones, in fact, um, the people that are journalists who have been donative, media people, contributing to funding raising for these UAVs. Therefore, I don't have anything to claim against the society. On the contrary, it's been helping us substantially. I have some questions to ask in the face of the government, because in a way, you know, we are also fighting for the sake of the state, of the government, because this government wouldn't still be stay standing if we were not fighting for it. And sometimes, they, frankly speaking, the government is under-delivering. De uh, I'm not fighting with drones just because I want it, but I use drones because I understand that UAVs can definitely help me to destroy different armored vehicles, different kinds of machinery, equipment, and personnel, and just make a millimeter this victory come closer to us. So I don't have any questions to put against the society or throw in the face of the society. And I'm so happy to see the society um, in the way that it is. But I definitely have some questions to throw in the face of the government. Dmitro, we've talked about the society here, we've talked about the government here, and you have all thanked, or several of you have thanked your Western partners. But what is your um, message to your Western partners? It, it sounds as though you all think this could be a long war, it will take time. What is your message in terms of the need to sustain and stick the course to keep going? Dimitro. You know, we can revert to your previous question in a way. By virtue of the fact that the society is getting tired, we are suffering from this fatigue, and the Ukrainians are kind of burning out. They're getting tired of the Ukrainian war, let alone foreigners, so other people living abroad of Ukraine. Of course, the government's rulers or military command, they can handle that, but for average rank and file citizens, it can be so difficult to comprehend that because you always understand that your pain always pains you so much more than someone else's pain. I would advise Ukrainians to keep living, relaxing, replenishing your energies, but still do not forget about your military. These things have to be combined. You cannot live separately. These things have to be united, merge into one. And the same goes for the whole world. We are enjoying an unprecedented level of support, and everyone seems to understand that if you have said A, you have to say B. Everyone has to continue playing this game. It's impossible to back out. Everyone understands what the end game is. So I don't think that we are going to have uh, this support withdrawn from us, it will be just growing. But right now, it's up to our partners to keep explaining to their societies that this matters not only for Ukraine, but it matters for the whole world. And that's the work that they have to do, you have to do, uh, trying to convey to every citizen in your respective countries. And just like I said, yes, you have to continue helping, and that's what you have been doing, and adamantly, thank you very much indeed, but we still require it so much more. Dennis, you, you started uh, in your remarks thanking your Western partners for the help for your, for your unit. Uh, would you also like to leave a message, because there will be many watching, about the need to stay the course? Thank you for your question. 
The support for the military at this point is an indelible part of the war that we are suffering from and waging right now under the current circumstances because the reserves and the resources that we had before the beginning of the full-scale invasion and before the war in 2014 were still short of different resources because Ukrainians are a resourceful kind of nation and we like MacGyvering Whatever you may give it to us, we will know, we will come up with the way how to apply it perhaps differently and in a witty way, just like my colleague has said, keep giving and keep giving more and we will handle it because we have been well trained. We know how to do it. In the first place, we opted for this pathway ourselves. Thank you. Alina, you were so eloquent in explaining what the war was for. Could you just, what, what, was, what it meant to you, could you briefly Tell us what for you is victory. Um, no, no, I see. As of now, it's a pretty tricky question for me. Because the victory which I imagined for myself outlined before the 24th of February 2022, because the, for me the war and for us the war started back in 2014, and the war that started in 2022, the answers to these two questions, to these kinds of war, they're very different. For me, there will never be a victory without the people that we don't have standing next to us anymore. Unfortunately, this is a very sad reality. This will never be the kind of victory that I was craving for. I will not have anyone to celebrate it. I mean, this victory, if it is worth celebrating, because this victory is going to come at a great cost. And this value and cost is measured in specific people's lives that we get to read in the obituaries every day. And whether this victory will be the victory that everyone's imagining to themselves, I very much doubt so. Whether I will live to this victory, I cannot guarantee it. Because I can die and can perish any moment, regardless of where I am, whether it be the front line with my brothers in arms or just in a trade center somewhere in Kiev and a rocket missile can hit it and I get killed. Therefore, I don't know whether I live to see this victory, and I'm not sure that this will be the kind of victory, let me repeat myself, that everyone is awaiting to see. Perhaps this is pretty pessimistic in terms of a message, but unfortunately I don't have another one to offer you. Yet, it's worth understanding that for this victory to come to happen, we have to work so much more and so much harder in the civil society in, in many ways. And I have written a brief message just to remind myself, getting back to your previous question, that we are fighting on the front line for the civilian population to ensure conditions for the further development of the country that deserves loving, being loved. This is about the fact that after this war, I would like to get back to the country that will, A, have some uh, government institutions of some kind, and B, this will be the country where we will continue talking about justice and see that this country still confesses and professes democratic values and that after this war, we will not have the non-democratic pathway to follow, let's put it this way, because if we consider history, a lot of the countries that went out, came out of wars, their democratic institutions unfortunately got weakened. And this is the point when the civil society has to put an oversight now, in a year, two years, until the victory, through the victory and past it, because our military now, tomorrow, or in a year's time will not be uh, contributing to reforms. Why? Because they're at, at war. They're also getting tired. They also respond acutely to different shocking situations. They're also suffering from PTSD. These people want to get back to the country after the victory that will not collapse from within, that will not be crumbling from within. And this is our reference point. We have to make sure this country is preserved within its territorial, uh, internationally recognized borders. I want to believe in that. And of course, we want to make sure that the heart and soul of this country is well maintained and preserved. And this is something that deserves a very good and kind emphasis to be placed on.
General Petraeus, I hope you will forgive me if I end it there, because it seems to me that first we are over time, and secondly, that is an incredibly eloquent description of what you are all fighting for. And I thank you all, um, and I think all of us owe you a tremendous amount. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being so honest.